And that's been a superpower for us. The deals that we're going to take a quarter million dollars of equity and be done in one year mm. ended up needing 400,000 of equity and took two years. Yes. And, 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 and for us, it's been a superpower having the brokerage cold hard cash coming in that gotcha. we're able to you know, backstop when yeah. we need to. And so that yeah. kind of combination. It's divide it's and conquer. Hello and welcome to the Real Good Podcast by Neighbor Good, a podcast designed for the next generation of property entrepreneurs and investors, where our guests share with us their stories, their tactics, and everything in between. Today, we have a really special, two really special guests with us, Dan and Shane from Young Learn Property Advisors. They are our partners all the way in Redwood City, San Francisco. Uh, and it is so cool to have you guys with us, man. Welcome to Cape Town. Uh, it's great to have you. Tell us about your experience here so far. So far, um, long trip. It was a long <laughs> trip, but we're we've glad to have made it. Um, and you've been very good, and hospitality has been great. Um, it's quite the neighbor good. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, Dan. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been super. I've been super excited for this trip awesome. for a while. I know we've been talking for about a year. So it's, it's awesome. gratifying to finally be out here and, and see the portfolio and, and see the, the beautiful mother city. Okay. It's awesome. Great. Yeah. Yeah. To give everyone some context, it's been about probably about a year and a half where I originally reached out, uh, to Dan. Um, they were doing some awesome things and they still are doing some amazing things, uh, leveraging an, an ADU. ADU means alternative dwelling unit arbitrage model where they acquire single family homes and then they are able to scrape the backyard or a part of the property that has additional bulk available. Um, and by adding on between three to 12 units, they're really able to create value in the process of doing that. I'll let them do a lot of the explaining, but it, it really comes from a lack of uh, affordable housing uh, in the entire state of California. Um, as as consummate millennials, we reached out on LinkedIn after reading an article uh, by a guy called Brad Hargreaves, who was the founder of uh, Common Living, which is another co-living company doing amazing things in the US. Um, and after about six months of back and forth, uh, really trying to understand each other, understanding the companies, the brand values, the models, working through budgets, and in everything from A to Z, um, we were able to sort of co consummate our relationship in the yep. form of mm -hmm. a property management agreement uh, in Redwood City for our, the first three buildings that we manage for Young Learn Advisors and their family companies. Um, and you will see if you come, if you're ever in Redwood City, um, you will see three neighbor good uh, names outside of the three buildings that we manage. And it, it's been a process with three us. Three and counting. Three and counting, man. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to start with you guys um, because that's why we're here. And to really give uh, our audience context into some of the awesome things that you guys are doing both in Long Beach and the US. Obviously, we are Cape Town born and bred. I'm originally from Durban, but we're heavily focused on building uh, a story and a strategy and an execu in, in, in execution with you guys in the US based on what you guys are doing, which I think is amazing. I think there's some incredible returns that we're seeing mm -hmm. um, out of your focus area. But I want to start at the beginning. Um, sure. And I want to know about the two of you um, and your, your histories. Where are you guys both from? How did you get into property? I'll, start. Go. I'll go, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so I'm from Redwood City, California, which is basically halfway between San Jose and San Francisco on the SF Peninsula, <laughs> kind of Silicon Valley uh, area. Um, I got into property, so, so my dad, Dan Sr., who you and the team know well, because he's involved with the Redwood City portfolio, uh, he's a structural engineer, and he started his own structural engineering company when I was maybe five or six years old, and he was always trying to get me interested in structural engineering point now look at the blue lamp beams and look at the rafters and look at all the and i, I was you always 
polite but never really engaged with that part of it but what i was interested in was how he built the business how he how people make money on things and how how it all fits together people product you know c customers clients all of that um but growing up i didn't really know i knew i wanted to go into business i i knew i didn't really want to do structural engineering it was, the math was too intimidating for me and, and just too high level so i went to university of southern california uh and and studied business um and I guess the way I got into it was that the summer jobs I was working were construction jobs. Uh, that's what my dad had connections to do. So I was spent my first summer after the first year of, of university uh, working on a distressed warehouse. It was half burned down and we were renovating it for the guy who had just bought it. And, and so when I got back to school uh, that fall, I, I was in a mentor program and I, they said, you know, pick a mentor. And so I picked a guy who was doing distressed real estate because I felt like well, that's what I've been doing. So, yeah. and, and one thing led to another and, and I ended up working for the mentors company um, and they were doing, this was 2011, 12, that, that kind of post great financial crash uh, of 08, they were buying houses, one to four unit properties for colony capital and Tricon American homes and Tricon ended up becoming one of the biggest single family home aggregators. I wasn't working with Tricon, but I was working for a, a group they were JVing with basically. And so I was running around the rougher parts of South LA and, and helping bird dog houses and do all that. I was working with a guy, John Ward, Turnstone was the company and learned a lot from him mm -hmm. um, and just realized quickly, this is, this is it. This is business. This is how I'm going to do business. And so it's related to structural engineering and obviously engineering is a, a piece of building and business and, and property and real estate and all that. Um, but, but also different kind of in my own spin on it in own way. And then when I graduated uh, college and went into the full working world, the, the Turnstone was kind of in a transition. And so I went and worked for Marcus and Millichap, which is a big commercial real estate brokerage firm where I met Shane. Um, and I was doing basically what I got assigned to was, was just standard multifamily. I didn't connect with that as much, but the area around USC where I went to school, very interesting, tougher area. So it's very much nuanced of what's a good student area and what's not a mm -hmm. good student area. Um, and so I fell into brokering around the, the college where I'd been and, and the game there at the time was it was all zoned multifamily sort of medium density. So people were buying houses and building triplexes in the backyard or scraping them and building a fourplex, basically a precursor to the ADU plan that we've ended up doing. And, and so I did that from 2014 to, well, I still do it. I'm still active as an agent in that area, but when the ADU laws past the accessory dwelling units, I realized that, hey, this model that's been working for my clients by USC, we can now do ourselves at other campuses. And so we're at Chapman University and Cal State Long Beach, two other colleges. And then we've had some other ways of applying it to like the co-living in Redwood City. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so at Marcus and Millichap, that's where I met Shane and I'll pass it off to him. But yeah, we, we partnered together for a variety of reasons. And it was definitely a blessing to, to connect with him when I did, because I think that really accelerated awesome. my, my ability to, to You guys have been partners for how long now? We started working at Eminem back in 2014. Okay. Yeah. It's um, almost 10 years. Spiritually 10 years, years yeah. but, but we weren't <laughs> yeah. officially partnered at Eminem. Okay. Yeah. When we started our own company in 2021. Yeah. Okay. 2020, 2021. 20, yeah. yeah. So when you were at it. school, were you selling houses when you were on the school, on the school field running around <laughs> <laughs> at school. So at school, I basically went to school. I went to Cal State Long Beach, um, okay. and was born and raised in Long Beach and went to school basically to, to sail competitively. And I, you know, restarted the sailing team and I sailed Monday, Wednesday, Friday for practice and we were traveling on the weekends, going different places to compete. And we'd, we'd go to, I'd have class Tuesday, Thursday, basically all day. Um, but I, you know, spent the lion's share of school raising money for the team and, you know, raising money for, for, um, like our travels cause we weren't funded by the school. Mm -hmm. And so I got a certain sense of entrepreneurship, you mm -hmm. know, being able to, you know, have those fundraisers and try and negotiate some, we ended up by the time I was graduating, getting some support from the school, which I didn't get to really benefit from, but, um, kids later, you know, did. So I'm happy about that. Got you. And this team's still going. So that's, awesome. you know, something to be proud of. So I'm that's pretty stoked about that. Um, and to pay the bills during college, I was coaching like high school teams and um, just the younger kids in the area. And one of the parents works, still works for Cushman and Wakefield. Um, and I ended up 
you know, I'd give his kid private lessons and we'd talk a lot when we were on the boat about real estate and about what it would take. And, um, he told me that he didn't think I'd be able to make it in real estate. No and so way. I've kept that in the back of my mind for many years. That's and the chip, chip on the, yeah. The idea and, uh, I had longer hair and didn't look the part. And so I cut my hair and started interviewing and ended up landing a job at Marcus mill chap. Um, which is like Dan said, where I met, where we met. Um, I remember Dan was the only one in our training group of like 12 people or something that knew what a cap rate was. And so I was like, yep, this guy. <laughs> he sounds about it. Yeah. I had to do some research and it was quick to figure out, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's where we met. And I started in a uh, typical multifamily brokerage in Long Beach and then expanded Long Beach in the South Bay, which is a little bit further north than Long Beach, like a half hour north and had, you know, built out a saw clientele, um, brokering five to 50 unit buildings, um, sometimes larger that, um, and 10 through one exchanges and, and the sort. So got you. Um, how important was, was really like kicking the tires and brokering, um, to what you guys are doing now? I mean, really understand one thing about being a property broker and, and being in property management as well. We feel like two great ways to start in the property space is either as a broker, whether it's residential or commercial, um, or in property management, because you really understand both sides of the coin. How important was that for you? You, you someone who leads that side of the business within mm -hmm. your partnership, uh, you know, kicking the tires, how important was that? Yeah, incredibly important. And, and it's, it's in part like learning the basics of underwriting and all that, but you you barely scratch the surface of of how principles underwrite and you know you're looking at a cap rate and you market a cap rate and a performer cap rate but you're not digging into return on cost the big companies at least from my experience haven't been teaching return on cost until you're probably at a, a higher level but in those first five or so years you really got to seek out the information um and then just from a from a um a different perspective like the work ethic and the time you have to put in and you know, creating your own destiny sort of. And, you know, you. we weren't, you know, you're not on salary. It's all commission. I lived with my parents Got for you. the first 15 months before I made my first paycheck. And I drove for Uber. He drove for Uber. Yeah. I remember I was you his did? first client. Yeah. No way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So it's, you really got to like, you're struggling to make it. And, yeah. and, and when you do quote unquote make it, you're still, you know, you, the goalpost moves. Always. Um, it's always moving. And so it's, it like, I don't know, it helps you learn how to live in that state um, gotcha. and sort of seek out the, the next advancement. Um, I think with brokerage too, you're, you're cold calling everybody. You're talking to as many people as you can. So you learn what's going on out there in the market. You learn what, you know, business plans people are doing this build in the backyard model that mm -hmm. I stumbled on. Nobody yeah. laid out the roadmap. It right. was just talking to a lot of people and realizing, Hey, Got people you. are making money over here doing this, doing that. And you get to a broad understanding of, of what's happening. If you're, putting in the dials gotcha, and yeah. talking to enough people, yeah. you know, and, and be willing to do that. I want to understand the progression from, is it Marcus Milhart? Marcus uh, and Milchap. Marcus and yeah. Milchap. I want to understand the progression a little bit better from when you guys were working together there and you found out that he knew about cap rates <laughs> to like the next steps and you guys taking the decision to partner together. What informed that? What, what were your objectives and how did that start? Yeah, um, we, we'd always been talking about it pretty much from the first year onwards of, of okay. hey, we can do this ourselves someday. You know, when Marks and Milchap, it's great training. It's a great place to, to start, um, but the house takes half your commission. And so it's, it's an expensive place to continue once you get established. And the firm tries to make you think that when you leave, it's, you're going to lose all this business you have, and they really instill that into you. But it's not true. It's, <laughs> you know, we, and I think we realized that pretty early on that, you know, the, the clients are working primarily with us. And, yeah. and, um, and so we'd always been talking about doing it and kind of in 2019, the, the ADU laws changed and we realized, so, so we bought our first couple apartments, just value add apartments in 2018, um, just off market, cold called someone. They said, I don't need to list. I know what it's worth, but I do want to sell it. And they didn't know what it was worth. And so we said, okay, we'll, we'll be the buyer, you know, if you don't want us to list it for you. And so, so we had done that, but that sort of, and that's how brokers typically, I think, get into owning deals, but that's needle in a haystack. That's not scalable. scalable that's just, you know, one in every 10,000 calls is that diamond in the rough. 
with the ADU model, when that law changed, we realized, hey, we can just go and buy listed properties at their market value mm -hmm. and make a really, really super return. And so that happened. So we kind of realized, hey, we're going to be doing more and more of our own deals, representing ourselves. We definitely don't need the firm. We're going to give the business to ourselves, you yeah. know, certainly. Um, and then right around that time, COVID hit. And so everything was shut down, gotcha. you know, as, as I don't know how it works here in SA, but the broker, if you're an agent, you're, you're affiliated with the broker, the broker owns your pipeline. So it's always hard if you're a, a broker worth your salt or an agent worth your salt to leave because you're, you know, cutting off your pipeline gotcha. at some point. COVID blew up our pipeline. And so when, when I left in 2020, I didn't have any deals mm -hmm. because everything had blown up because the world gotcha. had yeah, shut yeah. down. So it was a good time okay. to go. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what led to it. I Got guess. you. It took me a little bit longer to, to leave. I, I ended up leaving Mark Smil Shepard in 2021 and trying to close out a few deals and, and had a client that, um, that worked with me, I had a couple of clients that worked with me to like, we were on the tail end of a listing agreement and they, you know, we relisted at our company gotcha. um, once things expired and once everything was kosher. Um, but yeah, the, once we left the pipeline, as far as the brokerage goes, was, was maintained and we were still building business and we were still, it was not the smoothest transition, but more so because we had to do a lot of back office setting up the brokerage, setting up the systems, that sort of stuff. But as far as actual deals, the deal flow was maintained. And, yeah. Yep. Because of you two, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the partnership, there's a, a slight division on responsibilities. Maybe you can take us through that. Yeah. I think I'm more on the syndication development side and Shane's more on the brokerage agent side. Um, but I think it's, it started out, more disparate and it's gotten closer to, to even at this point would you yeah say? yeah um yeah I, I think you know shane was a super super successful broker gotcha. shane was the youngest first vice president in marcus millichap's history i remember uh pretty early on in our careers one of the older agents in the office super cool dude uh i just had sort of long-term client relationships but didn't actually work that hard at this point in his career yeah. he listed this hundred million dollar uh, mixed use residential over retail center right in the heart of downtown Long Beach. And they presented it to us, the sales meeting, but they said, this is a restricted list of clients that you can't call. And you know, this is only for the senior agents to call. And so I was, oh, that's too bad. You know, it'd be cool to work on that. And Shane said, fuck that. And called, <laughs> called them and ended up getting, I think, yeah, star, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. You? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So that's what I realized. Like, Hey, this dude's for real. <laughs> like this is a, uh, yeah, different. And, and so he had a much more valuable brokerage. Okay business and then i did mine was kind of weird and niche and and yeah, yeah. i've still kept it going but, got you but, uh, got you and that's been a superpower for us and uh, you uh, maybe maybe you don't know this because you guys are, are more organized and smarter and better than us but for <laughs> us so. it's certainly been you know the deals that we're going to take a quarter million dollars of equity and be done in one year mm. ended up needing four hundred thousand of equity and took two years yes. and and the it's harder to get into the promote than you expect mm. and all this stuff and i think a lot of developer young guys like us run into trouble because of that and and for us it's been a superpower having the brokerage cold hard cash coming in that gotcha. we're able to you know backstop when yeah. we need to and so that yeah. kind of combination it's divide and conquer and there's yeah. a lot of things that that you know dan's doing day to day that like if i was trying to operate the full brokerage house and also find the time to do the minutia of, of the syndication yeah it's like impossible to run two full-time successful yeah. businesses. So dividing and conquering time, really man. helps. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, Opco, Propco, in a way, uh, our version of your brokerage is essentially our operating company mm -hmm. that, yeah. that generates fees and you learn on the job and you create data and you uh, hopefully have some cash flow available to put into deals. Mm -hmm. yep. um, yeah. And that for us has been, you know, our ability, like your ability on the brokerage side. Yeah. Um, it's I'm tricky too. It's a mindset as a broker that, you're chasing everything that moves and just seeing what, what sticks and what goes as a developer. I don't take meetings that I haven't vetted that, you know, I mean, I'll take some, but I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm much sure. more, you know, religious with my time of, Hey, you don't just get to, you know, have a meeting, but, but then I try and put the broker hat on and yeah. this guy doesn't seem that serious, but whatever. I it's well go meet him and, yeah. And so it's, it's a hard thing to kind of yeah. mentally shift. I know. I hear you, man. Yeah. It's good to have a balance, I guess. Um, I'm quite keen to understand just for our audience in summary, because COVID was, you guys started very similar times to us. I think we started in, yeah. in July, 2020, um, in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. Three and a half years has gone by really quickly. Oh, yeah. uh, you guys have achieved an insane amount. 
Um, it's not just co-living. There's a big student residential portfolio as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in summary, take us through what you've done. Take us through what your portfolio looks like um, just for our audience to understand the context. Yeah, um, it's split, I would say, probably about half student resi and then a quarter co-living and a quarter just miscellaneous value-add apartments that we picked up along the way. We've got a, a eight unit in South LA, uh, a six unit in downtown Long Beach. It's not a Cal State Long Beach play. Um, we have a, a, a six unit in Redondo Beach. It's a block from the water and a really super cool area that we're, we're just finishing up. Um, we have a, a six unit, soon to be eight unit in Santa Monica, a super cool area. Um, got a fourplex in San Pedro, a, soon to be a fiveplex. Um, so a couple of sort of miscellaneous ones like that. Um, we have 20 student housing properties, um, primarily a house with an ADU behind it. One of the student housing properties is a ground up six unit that we're doing. That one's a little out of the box. Um, Average units per student housing? High bed count. So, okay. so typically it'll be two units, but between eight to 14 bedrooms. Okay. Um, and that's kind of the part of the, the thing with the student housing and the co-living you know, the, the benefit of the ADU is the, the selling market hasn't fully priced in, hey, there's developable land in the backyard. And so that's our arbitrage. But you only get to build typically one unit, sometimes a little bit more, but, but typically one unit. So the way to maximize that, we've designed a four bed, four bath, thousand square foot unit like the one at Jefferson mm -hmm. that you've seen um, that really maximizes that. And so being able to rent by the bedroom, whether it's co-living you know 20 30 year olds or mm. student housing 18 to 22 year olds is you know the way to maximize yeah. that and then we're also pushing to go larger we've got two parking lots in downtown long beach that we're building a 50 unit and 100 unit all studios about 400 to 500 square foot gotcha. studios that are in planning and and then the co-living so portfolio and, and redwood, the co -living city. In redwood mm -hmm. city is three different assets um like about 50 bedrooms in total yes. existing house duplex in yeah. front and then couple of ADUs in the rear. I want to go into the detail a little bit more, yeah. but uh, I'm going to end our time with you for this episode so we can jump in next. Thank you for coming. It's Super been awesome cool. to see you um, and we'll catch up soon. Thanks, cool. Corey.